We Sherlockians love to play the game, treating Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as real flesh and blood individuals, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle as nothing more than Watson's literary agent. But if we reluctantly admit that Holmes and Watson are fictional, another game presents itself, seeking out real life models for Sherlock. Surely a character as distinctive, as thoroughly realized as Sherlock Holmes could not have sprung fully formed from nothing but Doyle's imagination. He must have had some inspiration from the people in Doyle's life. While elements of Holmes's character can be traced to a number of sources, both real and fictional, Doyle himself claimed, and most Sherlockians agree, that the main inspiration for Holmes came from Doyle's medical school lecturer and mentor, Dr. Joseph Bell. As Holmes told Watson in the Boscombe Valley Mystery, you know my method, it is founded upon the observance of trifles. And this method, like so much else in the Holmes character, can be traced directly back to Dr. Bell. So who was this man who had such an influence on our favorite literary detective? Joseph Bell came from a long line of Scottish medical men. His great-grandfather, Benjamin Bell, shown here in a 1780 portrait by Sir Henry Rayburn, was considered one of the first major scientific surgeons. His 1778 textbook, A System of Surgery, helped lay out principles of modern surgery that are still used today. Joseph's grandfather, also named Joseph, and father, also named Benjamin, were prominent surgeons in Edinburgh as well, so Joseph's career was almost foreordained. Once his family found a profession and a naming convention, they really stuck with it. Joseph was born in Edinburgh on December 2nd, 1837, the son of Cecilia Barbara Craigie and Benjamin Bell, the second Benjamin in our list of Bells. His parents were deeply religious and their grounding in Christianity and biblical knowledge was an important influence on Bell throughout his life. Bell attended two primary schools as a youngster, Mr. McDonald's School and the Circus Place School, but at age 10, his, his parents enrolled him in the Edinburgh Academy. He spent the next seven years there receiving the type of solid classical education that Victorians went in for, Latin, Greek, and ancient history, but also modern languages and literature, plus, of course, scripture and religion. Along with the classics, Victorian educators also went in for corporal punishment in a big way. The toss or leather strap was in use at the Edinburgh Academy, just as it was in Doyle's early schools. However, unlike young Arthur, who came in for more than his share of whippings, young Joseph escaped almost entirely by being studious and cooperative. And fortunately, some of his instructors were supportive rather than brutal. The classics instructor, Darcy Thompson, was especially respectful and helpful toward his students, and Bell admired these characteristics, adopting them himself in his later work with children's welfare. Apparently, Bell always knew he would go into medicine like the previous three generations of his family, but in what might have been a slight gesture at rebellion, he actually left Scotland to start his medical education. After considering London and Paris, he eventually settled on the University of Leiden in Holland. Fortunately for us Sherlockians, however, he missed his hometown and soon arranged to transfer to the University of Edinburgh. By this time, the university's medical school had developed a reputation as one of the premier medical schools in Europe. In the course of his studies, Bell worked in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, the university's teaching hospital, as a dresser to Dr. James Syme. A dresser functioned as a sort of teacher's helper, assisting the doctor in surgical procedures, making sure the operating room was set up properly, and managing the quality of the surgical dressings. Syme and Bell became close and would remain friends for decades. Syme had a profound influence on the development of Bell's diagnostic method, and thus eventually on the analytical method of Sherlock Holmes. Bell liked to quote Syme's motto, Try to learn the features of disease or injury as precisely as you know the features, the gait, the tricks of manner of your most intimate friend. Bell graduated from medical school in 1859, the year of Arthur Conan Doyle's birth. Upon graduation, Bell joined the Royal Medical Society and delivered a dissertation that the society still possesses today. It was just the beginning of a long and successful career in medicine. 
Bell continued his relationship with Dr. Syme, serving under him as house physician at the Royal Infirmary. Syme's example of care and compassion for both patients and students no doubt reinforced the early scripture-based moral training that Bell received in his parents' home. At the same time, Syme's interest in scientific discovery and innovation, especially in the field of chemistry, was later echoed in Bell's development of new scientific methods for treating disease and performing surgery. Syme had been a legend at the university, both for his genius and for his colorful character. By the time Doyle started medical school, Bell had become just as legendary for many of the same reasons. In 1863, Bell passed the entrance exam for the fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. With Dr. Syme's encouragement, he published his graduate thesis in the Edinburgh Medical Journal that year. He was elected president of the Royal College of Surgeons in 1887. His positions at Edinburgh University included hospital surgeon, demonstrator of anatomy, and surgeon to the eye infirmary. In 1864, Edinburgh was racked by a serious diphtheria epidemic, thanks in large part to open sewers and generally unsanitary conditions. Bell threw himself into caring for the victims in spite of the extreme risk of close contact with patients. Since diphtheria devastates the upper respiratory tract, many patients had to undergo tracheotomies to be able to breathe. There was no technology at the time to remove infected membranes from the throat, so Bell decided to try using a thin glass tube to literally suck the bacteria from the back of a child's throat to help ease breathing. Not surprisingly, this resulted in Bell becoming infected himself. He was forced to leave Edinburgh for three months to recover from the horrendous symptoms. The illness left him with lifelong after effects, including a stiffness in his legs that produced an odd jerky walk and a distinctively high-pitched squeaky voice. These disabilities didn't keep him from a lifetime of achievements in medical science, forensics, and even criminal investigations, as we will see shortly. He was also able to serve as a justice of the peace and as the personal surgeon to Queen Victoria when she was in Scotland. While Bell was starting his career, he was also starting out in domestic life. He became engaged to Edith Erskine Murray in 1862, attracted not only to her beauty, but to her kindness and her devotion to religion, which mirrored his own. The two were married on April 17, 1865, and had three children. Jean, Cecilia, and of course, Benjamin, to carry on the family naming convention. Sadly, the marriage came to a premature end in 1874 with Edith's untimely death. This devastating loss left Bell with three young children to care for, but also brought the family closer together. Bell's daughter, Cecilia, remembered him entertaining the children by practicing his powers of observation on passersby, deducing their occupations and where they had traveled from. Bell also followed up on his and Edith's interest in care for the poor, helping to found the Longmore Hospital for Incurables in 1875. In 1883, Bell bought a large townhouse in Melville Crescent in Edinburgh, the better to house his family. Among Sherlockians, Bell is best known as the lecturer whose classes suggested to Arthur Conan Doyle the analytical methods that Sherlock Holmes would later use. Bell was 39 when Doyle first attended his lectures and started learning about the method, as Bell called it. Because the medical school had expanded greatly in the previous five years, students were largely left to select their own courses and professors and paid their lecturers directly. Bell was already a legend among the medical students for his powers of observation, logic, and deduction, as well as for his showmanship. But his commitment to medical education didn't stop in the lecture hall. In 1866, he published a Manual of Operations of Surgery for the use of senior students and junior practitioners. A teaching and reference manual about the latest techniques of scientific surgery, the book was widely used and is still in print today. Bell also gained a reputation for his medical articles, and in 1873, he became the editor of the Edinburgh Medical Journal, remaining in that post until 1896. He improved the journal's quality by covering medical issues outside of Scotland, especially the medic many medical advances in the United States. During his work in the hospital and infirmary, Bell saw firsthand the need for a robust hospital staff beyond just the doctors. 
Amazingly, in the mid-19th century, there were practically no nursing services in England. The few nurses available were usually either nuns or servants, generally without proper medical training. To remedy the lack, Bell began training nurses at the infirmary in 1868. Seeking advice from Florence Nightingale, who had established the Nightingale Training School for Nurses in 1860, Bell not only systematized the training of nurses, he helped to turn nursing into a legitimate profession, providing the opportunity for women to earn a respectable living and become involved in the medical community. Surgery in the Victorian era had come a long way from Elizabethan times, but certain aspects were still surprisingly primitive, especially in the areas of infection control. Bell pushed hard for simple innovations like sanitizing equipment and operating rooms, wearing clean surgical gowns that were changed for every patient, and good old-fashioned hand washing, which many doctors resisted for a surprisingly long time. We start to really see the connection between Bell and Sherlock Holmes and Bell's work in forensics. Although they may seem unrelated to medicine, Handwriting analysis and dialectology, the study of accents and speech patterns, fascinated Bell. His expertise in these areas, combined with his medical knowledge of drugs, poisons, organs, and cells, helped him to become one of the leading figures in the new science of forensic pathology. And thus we come to his greatest contribution to the development of Sherlock Holmes, the method. As Bell went about diagnosing his patients, he found himself relying on observation and deduction as much as on the word of the patients themselves. He gradually developed this approach into a system that he called the method and that he summed up as observe carefully, deduce shrewdly, and confirm with evidence. He loved to demonstrate the method in his lectures and he astonished Doyle with his demonstrations. Fortunately, Bell had hired Doyle as his outpatient clerk, performing preliminary questioning of new patients and bringing them into the lecture hall. According to Doyle's autobiography, I had ample chance of studying his methods and of noticing that he often learned more of the patient by a few quick glances than I had done by my questions. Occasionally, the results were very dramatic, though there were times when he blundered. In one of his best cases, he said to a civilian patient, well, my man, you've served in the army. I, sir. Not long discharged? No, sir. A Highland regiment? I, sir. A non-com officer? I, sir. Stationed at Barbados? I, sir. You see, gentlemen, he would explain, the man was a respectful man, but did not remove his hat. They do not in the army, but he would have learned civilian ways had he been long discharged. He has an air of authority, and he is obviously Scottish. As to Barbados, his complaint is elephantiasis, which is West Indian and not British. To his audience of Watsons, it all seemed very miraculous until it was explained, and then it became simple enough. Bell regaled his students with many more demonstrations of his deductive skills, and although he made the occasional wrong guess, his accuracy rate was astounding. Doyle took the lessons to heart, and throughout the canon we hear Holmes admonishing Watson, you know my methods, apply them. Like a real life Sherlock Holmes, Bell was often called in to aid the police in their investigations. On these cases, he frequently collaborated with another doctor who could also have served as a model for Holmes. Sir Henry Littlejohn was Edinburgh's official police surgeon, and in this capacity, he used the latest advances in forensic science, along with careful observation and deduction to solve crimes. Here are two examples of their collaboration. The first example even has a coincidental connection to Doyle. Young Arthur's French teacher at Newington Academy was one Eugène Marie Chantrel, a Frenchman who had washed up in Edinburgh after wandering through Europe and the United States. In 1867, Chantrel seduced and later married 15-year-old Elizabeth Dyer, whom he had met at a phrenology lecture. The Chantrell marriage was not a happy one, with Elizabeth suffering severe emotional and physical abuse. In January of 1878, Mrs. Chantrell was found seriously ill in her bed. Her personal physician called in Little John. It's not clear whether this was due to suspicion or simply because he wanted Little John's medical help. But by the end of the day, she had died. The apparent cause of death was a broken gas pipe in her room leading to coal gas poisoning 
but various suspicious circumstances, including the fact that her husband had recently taken out a large life insurance policy on her, led to his arrest for murder. Little John consulted with Bell, and the two conducted a detailed autopsy plus chemical analysis of vomit stains found on Mrs. Chantrell's pillow. They concluded that rather than coal gas poisoning, which would have left her internal organs permeated with the gas, she had died of a massive overdose of raw opium administered by her husband. The trial was relatively open and shut, with the jury deliberating for only an hour and a half but it served to illustrate the value of forensic science in crime solving. The Ardlemont murder was another sensational case on which Bell and Little John collaborated. Rather than chemical analysis of poisons, this case involved ballistics and a gunshot wound. On August 10, 1893, three men left the sumptuous estate of Ardlemont House to go hunting. The party consisted of young Cecil Hambro, an army lieutenant and heir to the estate, his tutor Alfred Monson, who had been working with Hambro for three years, and a mysterious Mr. Scott, who vanished from the scene early on. Later that day, Monson and Scott returned to the house, claiming that the three had become separated. Monson had heard a gunshot and discovered that Hambro had accidentally shot himself in the head with his shotgun while climbing over a fence. With a total disregard for the preservation of evidence, the Ardlemont servants removed Hambro's body from the scene of his death, carried it back to the house, and even dressed it in clean clothes to be presentable for the arrival of the local doctor. The doctor agreed that the death was a genuine accident, and on August 17th, Hambro was buried in a family plot. But on August 22nd, Monson started to trying to cash in a life insurance policy in Hambro, leading to suspicion on the part of the authorities. By August 29th, Monson was in prison and Little John had been called in to exhume Hambro's body. Little John immediately asked his friend Joseph Bell to assist him. Their autopsy, along with weapons tests performed by ballistics expert Dr. Patrick Heron Watson, note the name, determined that Hambro could not have killed himself. Based on the position and shape of the wound and the lack of powder burns, they demonstrated that the shots were fired by someone standing behind the victim at a distance of about 10 feet. The ensuing trial was long and sensational, and one would think that the forensic and ballistic evidence, along with the life insurance policies, would have been enough to condemn Monson. But a clever defense attorney was able to throw enough confusion into the proceedings that the jury returned a verdict of not proven. Not exactly an acquittal, but enough to set Monson free. The verdict was widely considered a miscarriage of justice, and it just goes to show that even the most brilliant of detectives can't win them all. With Bell being so closely associated with Little John, and with Little John being an actual professional associate of the police with many years of criminal investigation behind him, why is Bell so much more strongly associated with Sherlock Holmes? No one knows for sure, but the connection to the police may provide a clue. Bell was more of a hobbyist in criminal investigation, an unofficial consulting detective like Holmes, while Little John was officially connected with the police force. If he were to become publicly connected with Sherlock at the height of Holmes's popularity, it could have seriously compromised his work. Understanding this, could Bell and Doyle have deliberately conspired to keep Little John in the background to protect him? Regardless of the reason, Bell remains the most well-known model for Holmes. Some of the descriptions of Holmes seem drawn directly from Bell. According to Stamford in a study in Scarlet, Holmes appears to have a passion for definite and exact knowledge, certainly one of Bell's defining characteristics. In Holmes's famous observation upon meeting Watson, you have been in Afghanistan, I perceive, bears a striking resemblance to Bell's explanation of how he could tell that a patient was a non-commissioned officer in a Highland regiment of the army who had been stationed in Barbados. Both Bell and Holmes used the method throughout their careers in both criminal investigation and medicine. There were even some physical similarities, notably sharp, piercing eyes, thin hawk-like nose, and prominent square chin. However, Holmes was a taller and more robust physical specimen lacking the twitchy, uneven walk and high squeaky voice left over from Bell's bout of diphtheria. There are certainly behavioral differences as well. 
While Holmes was given to shrouding himself in tobacco smoke while working a three-pipe problem, Bell was a strict abstainer from tobacco and often admonished his students about its health dangers. It is also very unlikely that Bell ever abused narcotics in the way that Holmes habitually did, at least until Watson managed to wean him off of them. Most importantly, the two men differed greatly in emotional makeup. While both had a keen interest in justice and fairness, the resemblance ends there. Holmes said in The Sign of Four, love is an emotional thing and whatever is emotional is opposed to that true cold reason which I place above all things. Bell's love for his family, parents, wife, children, grandchildren, was a constant throughout his life. He would never have held himself aloof as Holmes did. Although Bell and Doyle were friends for many years, Bell sometimes seemed ambivalent about being identified with Sherlock Holmes. Like Doyle himself, he may have had a bit of a love-hate relationship with the character. Although there had been insinuations before, the Bell-Holmes connection went fully public in 1892. In May of that year, Holmes wrote to Bell, it is most certainly to you that I owe Sherlock Holmes, and though in the stories I have the advantage of being able to place him in all sorts of dramatic positions, I do not think that his analytical work is in the least an exaggeration of some effects which I have seen you produce in the outpatient ward. Then in October, Doyle dedicated the first edition of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes to Bell. Bell returned the favor by writing an admiring review of the book in The Bookman. Dr. Conan Doyle in this remarkable series of stories has proved himself a born storyteller. In private, however, Bell was not as enthused about the connection. Writing to Doyle, you are yourself Sherlock Holmes and well you know it. Doyle himself understood that being outed as Holmes could be less than pleasant for Bell. After the Strand magazine published an article linking Bell to Holmes, Doyle wrote to Bell commiserating that his old professor would now have to endure receiving letters from idiots, asking for his help, just as Doyle was constantly receiving letters to Sherlock Holmes asking for his detective services. The friendship between Bell and Doyle was not damaged, as shown by Bell's endorsement of Doyle in his unsuccessful run for Parliament in 1900. And we know that Doyle eventually made his peace with Sherlock after trying and failing to kill him off at the Reichenbach Falls. We can only hope that Bell got more enjoyment than aggravation out of his reputation as the model for Holmes. Bell gradually lessened his workload as the 19th century wound down. He resigned his position at the Royal Infirmary in 1886. Tragedy struck again in 1893 with the death of his son Benjamin from peritonitis. This second great loss took a toll on him that most of us in the modern era can only imagine. In 1896, he left his post after 42 years as examiner for the Royal College of Surgeons and also ended his tenure as editor of the Edinburgh Medical Journal. He resigned as chief surgeon of the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in 1897, but stayed on the board as consulting surgeon for the rest of his life. Even as he gave up some official positions, he remained an avid practitioner of medicine. With the increase in free time, Bell was able to pursue more of his lifelong interests in architecture, gardening, poetry writing, and fancy horse-drawn carriages. His grandchildren referred to him as gigs. As automobiles began replacing horses, Bell purchased a car in 1907, but unlike Doyle, who was a bit of a speed demon, he never felt comfortable driving and depended on a chauffeur. Along with all these other activities, he spent as much time with his grandchildren as possible and never lost his enjoyment of children and animals. Joseph Bell died on October 4, 1911, at the age of 73. In a funeral attended by scores of grateful colleagues, patients, family, and friends, he was buried in Dean Cemetery in Edinburgh, the city to which he had devoted his life and his talents. Many of the people whose lives were touched by Joseph Bell would no doubt have described him as Watson described Holmes in The Final Problem, as the best and wisest man whom I have ever known. Here is a partial list of material related to Dr. Bell, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the great detective himself, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs>